Part twelve of volume three of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume three of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. Translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Marcus Licinius Crassus. Part one. Marcus Crassus was the son of a man who had been censor and had enjoyed a triumph, but he was reared in a small house with two brothers. His brothers were married while their parents were still alive, and all shared the same table, which seems to have been the chief reason why Crassus was temperate and moderate in his manner of life. When one of his brothers died, Crassus took the widow to wife and had his children by her, and in these relations also he lived as well-ordered a life as any Roman. And yet when he was further on in years, he was accused of criminal intimacy with Licinia, one of the Vestal Virgins, and Licinia was formally prosecuted by a certain Plotius. Now Licinia was the owner of a pleasant villa in the suburbs which Crassus wished to get at a low price, and it was for this reason that he was forever hovering about the woman, and paying his court to her, until he fell under the abominable suspicion. And in a way it was his avarice with that absolved him from the charge of corrupting the Vestal, and he was acquitted by the judges. But he did not let Licinia go until he had acquired her property. The Romans, it is true, said that the many virtues of Crassus were obscured by his sole vice of avarice, and it is likely that the one vice which became stronger than all the others in him, weakened the rest. The chief proofs of his avarice are found in the way he got his property, and in the amount of it. For at the outset he was possessed of not more than three hundred talents. Footnote. Plutarch gives Greek values. The talent was a sum of money nearly equivalent to two hundred and forty pounds, or twelve hundred dollars with many times the purchasing power of money today. End footnote. Then during his consulship he sacrificed the tenth of his goods to Hercules, feasted the people, and gave every Roman out of his own means enough to live on for three months. And still, when he made a private inventory of his property before his Parthian expedition, he found that it, it had a value of seventy-one hundred talents. The greatest part of this, if one must tell the scandalous truth, he got together out of fire and war, making the public calamities his greatest source of revenue. For when Sulla took the city and sold the property of those whom he had put to death, considering it and calling it the spoil of war, and wishing to defile with his crime as many and as influential men as he could, Crassus was never tired of accepting or of buying it. And besides this, observing how natural and familiar at Rome were such fatalities as the conflagration and collapse of buildings, owing to their being too massive and close together, he proceeded to buy slaves who were architects and builders. Then, when he had over five hundred of these, he would buy houses that were afire, and houses which adjoined those which were afire, and these their owners would let go at a trifling price, owing to their fear and uncertainty. In this way the largest part of Rome came into his possession. But though he owned so many artisans, he built no house for himself, other than the one in which he lived. Indeed, he used to say that men who were fond of building were their own undoers, and needed no other foes. And though he owned numberless silver mines, and highly valuable tracts of land with the laborers upon them, Nevertheless, one might regard all of this as nothing compared with the value of his slaves. So many and so capable were the slaves he possessed. Readers, amanuensis, silversmiths, stewards, table servants, and he himself directed their education, and took part in it himself as a teacher, and, in a word, he thought that the chief duty of the master was to care for his slaves as the living implements of household management. And in this Crassus was right, if, as he used to say, he held that anything else was to be done for him by his slaves. 
but his slaves were to be governed by their master. For household management, as we see, is a branch of finance, in so far as it deals with lifeless things, but a branch of politics when it deals with men. He was not right, however, in thinking, and in saying, too, that no one was rich who could not support an army out of his substance. For war has no fixed rations, as King Akidamnus said, and therefore the wealth requisite for war cannot be determined. Far different was the opinion of Marius, who said, after distributing to each of his veterans fourteen acres of land, and discovering that they desired more, May no Roman ever think that land too small which suffices to maintain him. However, Crassus was generous with strangers, for his house was open to all, and he used to lend money to his friends without interest, but he would demand it back from the borrower relentlessly when the time had expired, and so the gratuity of the loan was more burdensome than heavy interest. When he entertained at table, he invited guests, were for the most part plebeians and men of the people and the simplicity of the repast was combined with the neatness and good cheer which gave more pleasure than lavish expenditure as for his literary pursuits he cultivated chiefly the art of speaking which was of general service and after making himself one of the most powerful speakers at rome his care and application enabled him to surpass those who were gifted by nature for there was no case they say however trifling and even contemptible it might be which he undertook without preparation. But often, when Pompey and Caesar and Cicero were unwilling to plead, he would perform all the duties of an advocate. And on this account he became more popular than they, being esteemed a careful man, and one who was ready with his help. He pleased people also by the kindly and unaffected manner with which he clasped their hands and addressed them. For he never met a Roman so obscure and lowly that he did not return his greeting, and call him by name. It is said also that he was well versed in history, and was something of a philosopher withal, attaching himself to the doctrines of Aristotle, in which he gave Alexander as a teacher. Footnote. Perhaps Alexander Cornelius, surnamed Polyhistor, a contemporary of Sulla. End footnote. This man gave proof of contentedness and meekness by his intimacy with Crassus. Nor is it not easy to say whether he was poorer before or after his relations with his pupil. At any rate, he was the only one of his friends of Crassus, who always accompanied him when he went abroad, and then he would receive a cloak for the journey, which would be reclaimed on his return. But this was later on. When Cinna and Marius got the upper hand, it was at once apparent that they would re-enter the city not for the good of their country, but for the downright destruction and ruin of the nobles. Those who were caught were slain, and among them were the father and brother of Crassus. Crassus himself, being very young, escaped the immediate peril, but perceiving that he was surrounded on all sides by the huntsmen of the tyrants, he took with him three friends and ten servants, and fled with exceeding speed into Spain where he had been before, while his father was praetor there, and had made friends. But finding all men filled with fear, and trembling at the cruelty of Marius, as though he were close upon them, he had not the courage to present himself to any one. Instead, he plunged into some fields, along the seashore, belonging to Vibius Pachyacus. In these was a spacious cave, where he hid himself. However, since his provisions were now running low, and wishing to sound the man, he sent a slave to Vibius. But Vibius, on hearing the message, was delighted that Crassus had escaped, and after learning the number of his party, and the place of their concealment, did not indeed come in person to see them, but brought the overseer of the property near the place, and ordered him to bring a complete meal there every day, put it near the cliff, and then go away without a word. He was not to meddle in the matter, nor investigate it, and was threatened with death if he did meddle, and promised his freedom if he cooperated faithfully. The cave is not far away from the sea, and the cliffs which enclose it leave a small and indistinct path leading inside. But when one has entered, it opens out into a wonderful height, 
and at the sides has recesses of great circumference opening into one another. There is no lack of water or of light, but a spring of purest flow issues from the base of the cliff, and natural fissures in the rock where its edges join admit the light from outside, so that in the daytime the place is bright. The air inside is dry and pure, owing to the thickness of the rock, which deflects all moisture and dripping water into the spring. Here Crassus lived, and, day by day, the man came with the provisions. He himself did not see the party of the cave, nor even know who they were, but he was seen by them since they knew and were on the watch for the time of his coming. Now the meals were abundant, and so prepared as to gratify the taste and not merely satisfy hunger, for Vivius had made up his mind to pay Crassus every sort of friendly attention, and it even occurred to him to consider the youth of his guest, and that he was quite a young man, and that some provision must be made for the enjoyments appropriate to his years. The mere supply of his wants he regarded as the work of one who rendered help under compulsion, rather than with ready zeal. So he took with him two comely female slaves, and went down towards the sea. When he came to the place of the cave, he showed them the path up to it, and bade them go inside, and fear nothing. When Crassus saw them approaching, he was afraid that the place had been discovered, and was now known. He asked them, accordingly, who they were, and what they wanted. They answered, as instructed, that they were in search of a master who was hidden there, then Crassus understood the kindly joke which Vibius was playing upon him, and received the girls, and they lived with him in the rest of the time, carrying the necessary messages to Vibius. Fenestella, footnote, a Roman historian who flourished under Augustus, end footnote, says that he saw one of these slaves himself, when she was now an old woman, and often heard her mention this episode and rehearse its details with zest. Thus Crassus passed eight months in concealment, but as soon as he heard of Cinna's death, he disclosed himself. Many flocked to his standard, out of whom he selected twenty-five hundred men, and went about visiting the cities. One of these, Malacca, he plundered, as so many writers testify, but they say that he himself denied the charge, and quarreled with those who affirmed it. After this he collected sailing vessels crossed into Africa, and joined Metellus Pius, an illustrious man who had got together a considerable army. However, he remained there no long time, but after dissension with Metellus, sat out and joined Sulla, with whom he stood in a position of special honor. But when Sulla crossed into Italy, he wished all the young men with him to take active part in the campaign, and assign different ones the different undertakings. Crassus, being sent out to raise a force among the Marci, asked for an escort, since his road would take him past the enemy. But Sulla was wroth, and said to him vehemently, I give thee as an escort thy father, thy brother, thy friends, and thy kinsmen, who were illegally and unjustly put to death, and whose murderers I am pursuing. Thus rebuked and incited, Crassus set out at once, enforcing his way vigorously through the enemy raised a considerable force, and showed himself an eager partisan of Sulla in his struggles. Out of these activities first arose, as they say, his ambitious rivalry with Pompey for distinction. For although Pompey was the younger man, and the son of a father who had been in ill repute at Rome, and hated most bitterly by his fellow citizens, still, in the events of this time, his talents shone forth conspicuously, and he was seen to be great, so that Sulla paid him honors, not very often accorded to men who were older and of equal rank with himself, rising at his approach, uncovering his head, and saluting him as imperator. All of this inflamed and goaded Crassus, although it was not without good reason that Sulla thus made less of him. For he was lacking in experience, and his achievements were robbed of their favor by the innate curses of avarice and meanness which beset him. For instance, when he captured the Umbrian city of Tudor, it was believed that he appropriated to himself most of the spoil, and charges to this effect were laid before Sulla. 
but in the struggle near rome which was the last and greatest of all while sylla was defeated and his army repulsed and shattered crassus was victorious with the right wing pursued the enemy till nightfall and then sent to sylla informing him of his success and asking supper for his soldiers however during the prescriptions and the public confiscations which ensued he got a bad name again by purchasing great estates at a low price and asking donations it is said that in brutium he actually proscribed a man without sylla's orders merely to get his property and that for this reason sylla who disapproved of his conduct never employed him again on public business and yet crassus was most expert in winning over all men by his flatteries on the other hand he himself was an easy prey to flattery from anybody and this too is said to have been a peculiarity of his that most avaricious as he was himself he particularly hated and abused those who were like him now it vexed him that pompey was successful in his campaigns and celebrated a triumph before becoming a senator and was called magnus that is great by his fellow citizens and once when some one said pompey the great is coming crassus fell to laughing and asked how great is he renouncing therefore all efforts to equal pompey and military achievements he plunged into politics and by his zealous labors his favors as advocate and money lender and his cooperation in all the solicitations and examinations which candidates for office had to make and undergo he acquired an influence and repute equal to that which pompey possessed from his many and great expeditions for the experience of each man was peculiar for pompey's name and power were greater in the city when he was away from it owing to his campaigns but when he was at home he was often less powerful than crassus because the pomp and circumstance of his life led him to shun crowds retire from the forum and render aid to a few only of those who asked it of him and then with no great zest that he might keep his influence the more unimpaired for use in his own behalf but crassus was continually ready with his services was ever at hand and easy of access and always took an active part in the enterprises of the hour and so by the universal kindness of his behavior won the day over his rival's haughty bearing but in dignity of person persuasiveness of speech and winning grace of feature both were said to be alike gifted however this eager rivalry did not carry crassus away into anything like hatred or malice he was merely vexed that pompey and caesar should be honored above himself but he did not associate this ambition of his with enmity or malevolence it is true that once when caesar had been captured by pirates in asia and was held a close prisoner by them he exclaimed o crassus how great a pleasure wilt thou taste when thou hearest of my capture but afterwards at least they were on friendly terms with one another and once when caesar was on the point of setting out for spain as a praetor and had no money and his creditors descended upon him and began to attach his outfit crassus did not leave him in the lurch but freed him from embarrassment by making himself his surety for eight hundred and thirty talents and when all rome was divided into three powerful parties that of pompey that of caesar and that of crassus for cato's reputation was greater than his power and men admired him more than they followed him it was the thoughtful and conservative part of the city which attached itself to pompey the violent and volatile part which supported the hopes of caesar while crassus took a middle ground and drew from both he made very many changes in his political views and was neither a steadfast friend nor an implacable enemy but readily abandoned both his favors and his resentments at the dictates of his interests so that frequently within a short space of time the same men and the same measures found in him both an advocate and an opponent and he had great influence both from the favors which he bestowed and the fear which he inspired but more from the fear and at any rate sicinius who gave the greatest annoyance to the magistrates and popular leaders of his day 
when asked why Crassus was the only man whom he let alone and did not worry, said that the man had hay on his horns. Now the Romans used to coil hay about the horn of an ox that gored, so that those who encountered it might be on their guard. The insurrection of the gladiators and their devastation of Italy, which is generally called the War of Spartacus, footnote, 73 to 71 B.C., end footnote, had its origin as follows. A certain Lentulius Batiatus had a school of gladiators at Capua, most of whom were Gauls and Thracians. Through no misconduct of theirs, but owing to the injustice of their owner, they were kept in close confinement, and reserved for gladiatorial combats. Two hundred of these planned to make their escape, and when information was laid against them, those who got wind of it, and succeeded in getting away, seventy-eight in number, seized cleavers and spits from some kitchen and sallied out. On the road they fell in with wagons conveying gladiators' weapons to another city. These they plundered and armed themselves. Then they took up a strong position and elected three leaders. The first of these was Spartacus, a Thracian of nomadic stock, possessed not only of great courage and strength, but also in sagacity and culture superior to his fortune, and more Hellenic than Thracian. It is said that when he was first brought to Rome to be sold, a serpent was seen coiled about his face as he slept, and his wife, who was of the same tribe as Spartacus, a prophetess, and subject to visitations of the Dionysic frenzy, declared it the sign of a great and formidable power which would attend him to a fortunate issue. This woman shared in his escape, and was then living with him. To begin with, the gladiators repulsed the soldiers who came against them from Capua, and, getting hold of many arms of real warfare, they gladly took these in exchange for their own, casting away their gladiatorial weapons as dishonorable and barbarous. Then Clodius, the praetor, was sent out from Rome against them, with three thousand soldiers, and laid siege to them on a hill which had but one ascent, and that a narrow and difficult one, which Clodius closely watched. Everywhere else there were smooth and precipitous cliffs, but the top of the hill was covered with a wild vine of abundant growth, from which the besieged cut off the serviceable branches, and wove these into strong ladders of such strength and length, that when they were fastened at the top, they reached along the face of the cliff to the plain below. On these they descended safely, all but one man, who remained there to attend to the arms. When the rest had got down, he began to drop the arms, and after he had thrown them all down, got away himself also, last of all, in safety. Of all this the Romans were ignorant, and therefore their enemies surrounded them, threw them into consternation by the suddenness of the attack, put them into flight, and took their camp. They were also joined by many of the herdsmen and shepherds of the region, sturdy men and swift of foot, some of whom were armed fully, and employed others as scouts and light infantry. In the second place, Publius Varinus, the praetor, was sent out against them, whose lieutenant, a certain furious, with two thousand soldiers, they first engaged and routed. Then Spartacus narrowly watched the movements of Cosinius, who had been sent out with a large force to advise and assist Varinus in the command, and came near seizing him as he was bathing near Selenae. Cosinus barely escaped with much difficulty, and Spartacus at once seized his baggage, pressed hard upon him in pursuit, and took his camp with great slaughter. Cosinius also fell. By defeating the praetor himself in many battles, and finally capturing his lictors and the very horse he rode, Spartacus was soon great and formidable. But he took a proper view of the situation, and since he could not expect to overcome the Roman power, began to lead his army toward the Alps, thinking it necessary for them to cross the mountains and go to their respective homes, some to Thrace and some to Gaul. But his men were now strong in numbers, and full of confidence, and would not listen to him, but went on ravaging over Italy. It was now no longer the indignity and the disgrace of the revolt which harassed the Senate, but they were constrained by their fear and peril 
to send both consuls into the field, as they would to a war of the utmost difficulty and magnitude. Gellius, one of the consuls, fell suddenly upon the Germans, who were so insolent and bold as to separate themselves from the main body of Spartacus, and cut them all to pieces. But when Lentulus, the other consul, had surrounded the enemy with large forces, Spartacus rushed upon them, joined battle, defeated the legates of Lentulus, and seized all their baggage. Then, as he was forcing his way towards the Alps, he was met by Cassius, the governor of Cisalpine Gaul, with an army of ten thousand men, and, in the battle that ensued, Cassius was defeated, lost many men, and escaped himself with difficulty. On learning of this, the Senate angrily ordered the consuls to keep quiet, and chose Crassus to conduct the war, and many of the nobles were induced by his reputation and their friendship for him to serve under him. Crassus himself, accordingly, took position on the borders of Picenum, expecting to receive the attack of Spartacus, who was hastening thither. And he sent Mumius, his legate, with two legions by a circuitous route, with orders to follow the enemy, but not to join battle, or even skirmish with them. Mumius, however, at the first promising opportunity, gave battle, and was defeated. Many of his men were slain, and many of them threw away their arms, and fled for their lives. Crassus gave Mumius himself a rough reception, and when he armed his soldiers anew, made them give pledges that they would keep their arms. Five hundred of them, moreover, who had shown the greatest cowardice, and had been the first to fly, he divided into fifty decades, and put to death one from each decade, on whom the lot fell, thus reviving, after the lapse of many years, an ancient mode of punishing the soldiers. For disgrace also attaches to this manner of death, and many horrible and repulsive features attend the punishment, which the whole army witnesses. When he had thus disciplined his men, he led them against the enemy. But Spartacus avoided him, and retired through Lycania to the sea. At the straits he chanced upon some Cilician pirate crafts, and determined to seize Sicily. By throwing two thousand men into the island, he thought to kindle anew the servile war there. Footnote, 102 to 99 B.C. End footnote, which had not long been extinguished, and needed only a little additional fuel. But the Cilicians, after coming to terms with him and receiving his gifts, deceived him and sailed away. So Spartacus marched back again from the sea, and established his army in the peninsula of Regium. Crassus now came up, and observing that the nature of the place suggested what must be done, he determined to build a wall across the isthmus, thereby at once keeping his soldiers from idleness and his enemies from provisions. Now the task was a huge one and difficult, but he accomplished and finished it, contrary to all expectation, in a short time, and running a ditch from sea to sea, through the neck of land three hundred furlongs in length, and fifteen feet in width and depth alike. Along the ditch he also built a wall, of astonishing height and strength. All this work Spartacus neglected, and despised at first, but soon his provisions began to fail, and when he wanted to sally forth from the peninsula, he saw that he was walled in, and that there was nothing more to be had there. He therefore waited for a snowy night and a wintry storm, when he filled up a small portion of the ditch with earth and timber, and the boughs of trees, and so threw a third part of his force across. End of Marcus Licinius Crassus, Part 1